morning. So grateful that truly your mercies are new and afresh every day, moment by moment. And Lord, as we stand in awe of who you are, we are thankful and we want to bless your name. So Lord, we've come here to praise you and to thank you and to continue in our, our time of worship together as we open your word. And as we open it, Lord, we do so asking that you would open our eyes. Lord, open our eyes that we might see. Lord, open our hearts that we might receive. Lord, do a work, do a work that we might be changed. We love you, Lord Jesus. We acknowledge your presence here. And I ask, Lord, personally, put your word in my mouth. Put your word in my mouth. Holy Spirit, may you speak forth this day, doing the work that you want to do. And Lord, make us vessels that are receptive to it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We're going to be in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Mark that, but turn to Job chapter 1. Romans 8, 28. We've been going through the book of Romans. In chapter 8, it's been a snail's pace. But that's okay. That's okay. But today, if the Lord wills, we will be completing chapter 8. So Romans 8, 28, but first Job chapter 1. What's wrong with you? Why are you acting like this? Oh, you're having a bad day. I'm sorry. Is there something I can... I can't? There's nothing I can do? Well, I've had a bad day before. I've had bad days before. Have you had bad days before? Amen. I don't want to belittle what a bad day is or what it feels like to have one of those days because I know you'll feel discouraged. You'll feel dismayed, disappointed, disheartened. So when anybody asks you, is there anything I can do? If anyone asks you, what's wrong? What do you think? Does it really matter? Does it really matter? Does anyone really care? Does anyone really care? I know that feeling. I've been there. I've done that. I think we all have. But that's when the enemy comes in. That's when the enemy begins to whisper, hey, just give up. Just throw in the towel, lay it down, drop out, leave. It's the best time to do that, isn't it? You're having a bad day. Just give up. And as the depth of your down can be so low, and it may be so low for someone here today, you just don't want to quit your job. You, you just don't want to quit your family. You don't want to just quit your faith. You've actually been contemplating quitting life. You've had those thoughts. Why? Is this it? <laughs> Well, you've had a bad time, a bad day, and a bad day's turned into two or three bad days, and now it's two or three bad years. And yes, you're having a bad time of it. But let me ask you a question. Just how bad is it? I mean, can I, can I show you a bad day? Can, can I share with you a bad day? I mean, a really, really bad day? Look in Job chapter 1. You should be there, picking it up in the 13th verse. Job 1, verse 13. Now there was a day when his, Job's sons and daughters, were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. When the Sabaeans raised up and took them away, indeed, they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was speaking, another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven 
and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, another also came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands, raided the camels, and took them away, yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, another also came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people. And they are all dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. That's a bad day. <laughs> In one day, four messengers bringing news of the loss of fortune and family. Well, I know someone here is probably thinking, well, he lost his family. He lost his fortune. Hey, but at least he's got his health, right? He's got his health. Well, look at chapter 2, verse 7. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he, Job, took for himself a pot shared with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of the ashes. It's not just his family. It's not just his fortune. Now it's his flesh. It's his flesh. <laughs> well... And some of you are thinking, hey, he's still got his wife to help him through this difficult time, right? <laughs> he's not alone. Look at verse 9. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. The one family member that's left, Job's thinking, Lord, you missed one. <laughs> How do, how, how, how do you react to something like this? A tsunami wipes out entire cities, taking entire families, entire homes, earthquakes, tornadoes, entirety of lives completely upheavaled, completely destroyed, completely changed. How do you respond? Let's say this is your bad day. The world is watching you. And, and if you didn't know this, Job is described as a righteous man. If you're a born-again Christian, you are described as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You're a righteous person. Job is described as a righteous person. How does he react? In all of this, in no way did he ever accuse God or blame God. What did he say? Blessed be the name of the Lord. He giveth and he taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You're the righteous, and how do the righteous react? I, really, this is a really bad day. How do you react? For Job, it's more than a day. For some here, it's been more than a day. It's a season of suffering. So how to react, how to respond to seasons of suffering? Well, first, number one, you realize that this is a revelation to the unbelieving world. What? It's a revelation to the unbelieving world because they see how you cope with suffering, with tragedy. They see how you cope with things. And what you do is going to formulate how they think about your God. Right? Secondly... It's Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Go ahead and turn there. Romans 8, verse 28, where we read, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. Amen. To those who are the called according to His purpose. For whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom He predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. What's going on here? Listen. God's picking his team. God's picking his team. He's what? That, is that biblical? Yeah, yeah, God's picking his team. <laughs> it, it's biblical. It's okay. What, what do you mean? Remember growing up? Remember growing up at recess? 
lunchtime, after school, you'd hear this, I'm captain, I'm captain too. And, and so there'd be two captains, and you'd line up with all the kids. And, and the captains, they, what they do, the first person they picked was like the best. I'm picking Johnny. He's fast, man. Nobody can, you know what? He can outrun anyone. Well, I'm picking John over here. He can hit further than anybody else. And then after they pick those guys, they pick the best friends. They pick their best friends. Hey, come on, come on, come on. And after that, it was their neighbors. Hey, they, they're neighbors, you know, you can't say no. And then there was always one guy left. And one captain will look at the other. You want him? You can have him. I don't want him. Why do I have to have him? You take him. I... God's picking his team. He's picking his team. And I know that there's at least one mother here, and there may be somebody here who, hearing that, their heart tighten up. Because, moms, how many days did you spend consoling your son for being rejected because he wasn't picked? He was pushed off on people. Some of you are shaking your head. And, and you know what? Then there are, there are those here who also were that kid. That's me. I, it's not a laughing matter. It was me. I was that kid. You take him. I don't want him. And, and you know what? And, and, and some of you were wearing this cap. <laughs> you were wearing the cap. And, and you know what? You wore it through school because everyone knew you were rejected. You were the worst. You were the, my, my nickname in, in grade school, they call me Claude Hopper. It's called Claude Hopper. See, I was very overweight, and so like at sixth grade graduation, a bunch of the kids came to me and they said, you're not going to the pool party. We had a graduation pool party. You're not going. You're so fat. I mean, aren't you embarrassed to take off your shirt? These are kids. See, I, I wore the hat. Some of you wore the hat. Some of you are still wearing the hat. You're still wearing the hat. God's picking his team. And if God is picking his team, there's not going to be any losers on God's team. Amen. Okay? Right? Wrong. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> See, because unlike the world, God waits until all the best players are picked. And that one kid that's left, that one kid that's rejected, he goes, come on, you're on my team. You're on my team. See, God doesn't pick the big things, the great things of the world. He picks the rejected things, the abased things of the world that he might glorify himself through them to Amen. confound those wise, Amen. to confound those people that are the great athletes. God waits, and he waits. And he says, I want you on my team. Why? Because one God, once God puts his hand on the rejected, once God puts his, puts his hand on them, then the world watches as God transforms this loser, this lump of coal, into an eternal gem, an eternal diamond. And the world watches. The world watches and says, wait a minute. I thought he was a loser. And all you can say is, except for the grace of God, there go I. Amen. There go I. Amen. And so how does God pick his team? How does God pick his players? First and foremost, if you're taking notes, God picks those he knows. Look at verse 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That word foreknew. It's a wonderful word. Circle it, underline it. And in the original Greek, it comes to us from two words. The first one means before. It's from before. And it's something that happens before. And the second word is a wonderful Greek word. It's nosko, gnosko. Before experienced. God picks from before based on his experience. God's experience, and what this is saying is, listen, it's important. God knows. 
both ends of the spectrum. God knows. God chooses beforehand, exercising a knowledge that only He knows, and He only knows it because He's been there, done that. He's been there. He's done that. It's like God has already seen this movie. It's a great movie. It's coming out soon. You all need to buy tickets. The Life and Times of David. God's already seen it, which means because God has already seen this movie, God knows the day and how David dies. God, tell me. I want to know. Can't tell you. Well, no. If you know, tell me. Well, I can't tell you. Why not? I want to know. Because all things work together for good. He can't tell me. Why can't he tell me? He doesn't want to spoil it. He doesn't want to spoil it. It's like this. Have you ever been sitting down watching TV, and you're flipping, and you, you, a movie grabs you, and so you're watching, and you're going, oh, wow, my spouse would really like this movie. And you, so you watch it. You watch it all the way through. And, oh, yeah, they're going to love this movie. So you go to the red box or the blockbuster, blockbuster box or whatever they have now, and you rent that movie, and you say, hey, hon, I got this movie. you got to watch it. So you pop the popcorn and all that, and you're sitting there, and at all the suspenseful, intense places, you see them go, like, you know, and they look, what's going to happen next? Can't tell you. <laughs> what do you mean you can't tell me? What's going to happen next? And trust me, if you told them, you're in the doghouse for the rest of the day. <laughs> because what they're really asking, what they really want to know, does it have a happy ending? Does it end good? Because there's nothing worse than to think, oh, this is going to have a happy ending and the hero dies. You go, whoa, where did that come from? What a twist. They want to know, is it going to have a happy ending? And this is when you can hold their hand, look them in the eye and say, honey, I can't tell you, but what I can tell you, we know that all things work together for good. <laughs> That's what God's telling you in your life. You're going, God, what's happening next? I can't tell you. Trust me. Walk with me. But God, you know. I can't tell you. Why not? Don't want to spoil it. What? I don't like surprises. <laughs> Listen, David. All things work together for the good. They work together for the good. They work together for the good, right? You don't understand why certain things are happening. You don't understand why this happened and that happened. You don't understand how you got to this point in life. These are the things, and there are things going around you in life, and you're going, what in the world is going on? You go, I didn't plan for this, Lord. This is not on my bucket list. <laughs> You're saying, God, uh, these, these actors you have in this scene, not buying it, man. You need to fire them. I don't like the actors. I don't like the director. I, I don't want to complain, but the producer, uh, you need to work on that. Can't we just start over and make a new movie? Right? The bottom line is you don't see because you don't know, and you don't believe that all things are going to work together for good. To whom? To whom? To those who love God. To those who are the called. And I underline that. The called. The called according to God's purposes. And, and God is telling you that you have to trust Him. He's saying, hey, you've got to trust me on this. Why? Because He foreknew you. He foreknew you. Before you were ever born. In fact, God foreknew you. And the implication is that God just doesn't see what's going on now. God knows everything that's in the future. And because God sees both now and the future, He says, trust me to pick the people and the places that I need to put to get you to the intended destination. Trust me to do this. I see the end. You trust me. You don't see past your nose. You trust me and I'll get you there. So what's the point? What do we learn? If God does, in fact, know the future, and if you are about to make a decision concerning your future, we have some college kids in here. Olivia was here for the first service. She's going away to a far eastern country. They don't like Jesus at that place. If you're going to make a decision concerning your future, wouldn't it be wise to touch base with God? Amen. To keep in constant contact with God? To ask Him. Wouldn't that be a wise choice? 
And, and wouldn't it be wise to seek godly counsel? Not, not people that are going to agree with you, but godly men and women that are going to give you truth. Because isn't the truth what you really need to make that decision? And, and wouldn't it be good to say, hey, God's given me truth and wisdom in this book. Wouldn't it be good to open this up and say, hey, God, I have this decision to make. Should I marry this person or should I not marry that? Should I take this job? Should I move? What should I do, Lord? And you seek him on a daily basis. Wouldn't that be wise? Amen. Wouldn't that be wise? But what happens? So many people predetermine what they're going to do and they seek out wisdom based on what they want to do, not what God wants them to do. So when it blows up in their face, they cry out, God, why would you do this to me? What? What? I mean, God. And God's going, hey, I tried to talk to you. I gave you my word. I'm here waiting for you to talk to me. And I keep saying, David, here I am. I'll help you. I'll guide you. Hey, I sent these godly men and women to be around you. And did you ask any of them? No, because you didn't want to hear what they had to say. You went to the world to get wisdom from the world. And it's blown up in your face. There you go. You think God did this. God's going, no, I didn't. I'm trying to talk to you. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now, church? He's trying to talk to you. God says, I've already seen it. Anybody know that game, Seen It? You know, you play that game, Seen It? It's a DVD about movies and music and all this stuff, Disney. You know, it's like God's seen it. He gets all the answers right. And God tells us it will work out. It will work out. There will be a happy ending for those who are the called. Circle that word, the called. Underline it right next to it. It means invited. Invited. It will work out for those who are invited. What do you mean invited? Who's God invited? Whosoever. What? God has invited whosoever. Yeah, whosoever. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish and have everlasting life. God has invited whosoever. Whosoever believes. Everyone's invited. Everyone's invited. Everyone got an invitation in the mail. Jim's having a birthday party. Did you get your invitation in the mail? <laughs> No? Well, God sent one out to, his, to the, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Did you get that? Yes. Did you open it? I know there's a few here who didn't. <laughs> you haven't opened it yet. But guess what? Today's your day. You can open it. Because see, to those who are called according to His purpose, and what is God's purpose for you? What is God's purpose? Look at verse 29. God's, everybody's, what's God's will for my life? What's God's purpose? Verse 29, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. God wants you to be like Jesus. Amen. That's what that says. As we seek God concerning every aspect of your life, the closer we stick to the Lord, the wiser our decisions become. Because we're like Jesus. And everything Jesus did, he sought the Father. He looked for the Father. He sought the Father's will. And everything he did, and guess what? He did a good job. He did a really good job for us. So not only has God been there, done that, seen it. Point number two, God chooses those he's predestined. Now that's a word that messes a lot of people up. It's been used out of context to create specific doctrines and teachings that confuse people. But what we have to understand is what is this saying in the context in the original language? It's a very powerful word. And in context, it provides just incredible insight to what God desires for us. Before time began, God placed in every single person a destiny. A destiny. See, the word predestiny. 
That's what it is. It's predestiny. God has a destiny for your life. God has a perfect plan for your life. It's kind of like this. Does anybody remember Back to the Future? Did anybody here see that movie? Am I speaking to like the walls? Anybody here seen that movie? Okay, remember McFly? Total dork. Okay, his son goes back to the future and he sees his dad and he says, Dad, you got to ask mom out, Lorraine. And so he stumbles and he has it all written down and he's fumbling over his words and he looks at her and he says, Lorraine, you're my destiny. You're my destiny. See, God has a destiny for each and every one of us, a purpose, a plan. And, and the word here, conformed, is to have a similar form. A similar form to be the same nature, the same style as Jesus. It's a similar form. So what you have is, here's your life, right here. And you're like just all over the place. These are your decisions. Whoa, whoa, this is your life. Up and down, you're all over the place. Here's God. God's like GPS. You're all over here and God's like going, hey, here I am. I will lead you. I will guide you. I will take you to your destiny. I will help conform you. I will help bless you. And so as we get closer to the Lord, we start conforming. It's like this. This is an example. Those of you that have little kids or had little kids, remember when they first started learning how to clap their hands? It's like some of you during worship. <laughs> yeah, you're busted. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Everybody laughs at me, so. No, but literally, it's like they, they, they kind of catch a little bit of their hands, and then, and then they see you fold your hands, and they try to do it. Have you ever seen a little baby try to fold their hands? It's, it's like a, an adventure for them. They're like going, because like it doesn't fit. But if I ask you to fold your hands, fold your hands. That's what conforming is. This is conforming. See, here's God, here are you, and as you walk with the Lord, you conform into that image. You conform into that image. There, there's a great biblical uh, picture for this. It's found in Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4, we read, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Now, most people believe that life begins in the womb, but God is saying, You're so wrong. <laughs> before the world, before the world, before anything, before, before you were in the womb, God knew you. He knew you. And He says, Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. So, so we can see that before Jerry was born, God knew him. Before he was even in the womb, he was, he was known of God. And in this first part, we see God's foreknowledge. And in the second half, we see God predetermining a plan for his life. Predetermining it. In verse 8, we read, Then I said, Oh, Lord, Lord, Lord God, behold, I can't speak. I, I'm a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say that I'm a youth, for I shall go to, uh, you shall go to whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. At, at first glance, you look at this and you go, Man, Jerry didn't have any chance. I mean, he, he, no choice here. You're going to do what I tell you to do. But that's not true. That's not true at all. See, Jerry could have said no. He could have said, no, 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 I'm not going. I'm not going to do it. Because you do have a chance. God says sovereignly, I have chosen a path for you. I have chosen a plan for you. And if you follow this path and this plan, you're going to be blessed. And you can say, no, I'm going to do my thing. I'm smarter than you, God. You don't really know me. You don't understand what really makes me click. And God says, okay. And so here you are going all over the place, up and down. You're like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> One day's good, next day's bad. Then it gets worse. <laughs> Some of you are laughing because you would be crying otherwise. <laughs> and God says, no, here's my plan. I'm not moving from that plan. I'm not changing my plan for you. And so as you say, okay, Lord, I'm going to submit. I'm going to conform. I'm going to try. Oh, 
Wow, this is great. God is blessing. I have peace. Uh, this is wonderful. All these things are happening. They're terrible in my life, but the joy of the Lord is just filling my life. Amen. Did you see how Jerry react? As God's plan is so specific that Jerry, got, no, he hesitates, he, he resists. And, you know what? And, and it's like, Lord, I can't do this. I'm not a prophet. I'm young. I can't speak. Sounds a lot like Moses at the burning bush, huh? Lord, I have a stammer. And of course, Moses was a prince. He was educated, highly educated. And of course, if you stand before a burning bush, I guarantee you're going to have a stammer too. You, like me, maybe know how Jerry feels. Before we moved to Arizona, my final, well, not my final senior pastor, the senior pastor before my final senior pastor decided he was called elsewhere, and so he was leaving the church, and they were doing a pastoral search. At that time, I was over youth ministries and young adult ministries and maintenance and all that other stuff. And a few of the church said, have you applied for this position? And I said, no, I don't feel called to it. I feel like God has me where he wants me, and I'm content. Well, they went to the senior pastor and said, why aren't you considering David for this? There was a nine-man team that were going through all the tapes and the national search. They went to him and said, why aren't we considering David for this? He called me into his office. He goes, who do you think you are? Do you want my job? Do you want this job? Do you think you can teach? Who do you think you are? I'm going to tell you, Tim is the right man for this job, and you will never be a senior pastor, and you will never be a teacher from the pulpit. You can't teach nothing. I'm thinking, I don't want your job. <laughs> uh -uh. Kids are easier. <laughs> Really? <laughs> I mean, I, obviously it stuck with me, and it sticks with me. And it was interesting because there was a guy who was a, a, a coordinating pastor over the Presbyter all the Presbyterian churches in the Philippines. He came to this church. He was standing outside the office. This was not a quiet conversation he was having with me. He pulled the pastor aside. He told me this afterwards, and he said, Do you realize you just cursed your ministries? And he said, What are you talking about? He said, This is a Jewish man. The Bible says... Those who you curse, you will be cursed. And if you bless them, you will be blessed. So he pulled me into his office about a week later and he said, Hey, if I said anything or anything like that, I don't... <laughs> and I'm like thinking, really? Why are you even apologizing if, you, if I said anything? <laughs> now, the point is, that's with me. And some of you think that this is natural. That David came out of the womb to be a pastor. Whether that's true or not, that's God. But this isn't natural for me. This is very unnatural for me. A lot of you think I'm so loving greeting people out there. Do you realize I'm out there because in case I throw up? <laughs> I'm serious. And those of you that really know me know that this isn't natural because I am concerned constantly. This is the word of God. And it says, let there not be many teachers for greater is the condemnation of those that open this and teach from this. And so I literally am torn in two, literally having the runs for the rest of my life because I, this is God's word and this isn't natural and this is not, if this is not a calling, then I, I can't be here. Do you understand that? But some people, oh, it was so, he's so natural. And it's like, no, it's not. It's the hand of God. It's submitting and conforming and letting him move me and letting him do it through me. God knows me. Just as God knows you and God predestined me. And the closer I get, the closer I get to him, the closer I let my digits intertwine with him, then he puts me on that perfect path. That's true for you. That's true for you. Our third point, God called you. Each and every one of you here, you're the called of God. You see, 
the word called deals and it's comprised of two main things. The first one is sovereignty of salvation. The second one is sanctification. Okay, so there's salvation, and after you're saved, after you've asked Jesus to be your Savior, after you know the love of God in your life, He's now called you to be sanctified. Sanctification is through service. It's through service. So there's the sanctification of service. The word called literally means, and this is exactly what it means in the original Greek, to choose for receipt of a special benefit or experience. The idea is you're called by God to receive a special benefit or a special experience. And you only do that through service. You only get it through service. If you're not serving the Lord, then you're not going to receive that special benefit. Now, this isn't a call for you know, everybody to sign up for Sunday school or anything like that. What it is, it's a call for you to get with God, to talk to God, to seek God out and say, what do you want me to do? And as you start taking baby steps, and it might be in the children's church, it might be, you know, cleaning, it doesn't matter what it is, God reveals this to you on a daily basis. You don't stand here overnight. It doesn't happen that way. Chuck Smith didn't overnight get in the pulpit. He served in Sunday schools, then he served as a youth pastor, and God led him and guided him through much trial, much tribulation, and much failure. But God wants to bestow upon you a special experience. But if you don't answer or if you ignore that call, do 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 can you hear me now? <laughs> doo -doo 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 -doo. God's calling. God's calling, constantly calling you. Hey, David, turn here. Oh, no, no, I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy. I'm too busy to turn here. I missed the call. I missed the call. Now, many of you have answered God's call for salvation, but not service. And many, and it's amazing, many in, in churches are serving and they're not saved. They, they got to intersect together. They got to work together. I've been to many pastors' conferences and stuff, and it's amazing. At an altar call, you actually see pastors who've been serving in the pulpit going forward to receive Christ because God finally says, you're mine. James chapter 2, and just so you know, there's no buts to service. But, 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 no, 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 there's no buts. James chapter 2, verse 18, we read, But some will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you also want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham your father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? That's sanctification. That's sanctification. Works working with your faith, with your salvation, is sanctification. It's perfecting you. If you're called to be his and you're wrestling with God, some of you are wrestling with God. Stop it! Really? You think you're going to win that battle? No way! No way! One way or another, you're going to lose that battle. Either you're going to lose it for God's glory, or you're going to lose it for your destruction. So stop! Stop! Give in! Don't be like Jacob, where he has to touch your hip and it's out of joint and you've got to limp for the rest of your life. That's no way to go through life. God's knocking on your heart. God's speaking to someone here today. Can you hear him? See, you need to heed the call and finally begin to live the life that God planned for you. For you. And listen, 2 Timothy 1.7 we read, For God has not given us a spirit of fear. That's what's holding you back. What if I fail? He won't. If God's in it, you'll be successful. But, a pow but of power and of love and a sound mind. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us. If he saved you, he's called you with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his, pur his purpose, his own purpose, 
and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. His plan's not going to change for you. If you want to fulfill that plan, you have to change or allow Him to change you. Now listen, none of us are catching God off guard. None of, God's not going, I can't believe He came to church. <laughs> no, there are some that are supposed to be here that didn't want to hear the call. They hit the snooze button. I'm tired. He's not, we're not catching God off guard. He has been here. He has done that. He has seen it. And he's seen what's going to happen. And right now, do you understand? Right now, God is stretching forth his hand down from heaven to you. Right now, God is saying, come on. I'm ready to take you to the next level. You want to come with me? You, you ready for peace that passes understanding? Are, are you ready for unspeakable joy in your life? Right now, God is reaching down from heaven to you saying, come on, are you ready? Are, are you ready to let me do this for you? Are you tired of doing it on your own? Right now, God is saying, hey, here I am. Are, are you ready? Are you ready? Don't put your hands in your pocket. Amen, brother. Submit. He's reaching down. God has an incredible plan. God has an incredible plan. The question is, who's going to answer? Who's going to take the hand? Can you hear me now? Can, can you hear him? Can you hear me now? We should be grateful for our salvation, absolutely. But God wants you to find your place in the body of Christ. God wants you to man your position so that you will be conformed in the image of His Son. And that's why Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and your election sure. For if you do these things, you will never... Stumble. Any stumblers here today? <laughs> be diligent. See, your election is salvation. Your call is your service, your sanctification. And, and, and Paul put it like this in Philippians 2.12, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for His good pleasure. Do you see what he's saying here? He's saying, listen, I'm going to give you the desire to do that. Right now, God's saying to someone, I'm giving you the gift of evangelism. You're going, not me. Uh -uh. <laughs> no, I'm going to give it to you. It may not be from a national platform. Where's Vic? There's Victor. God, God has given him the gift of evangelism. Go to Home Depot or, or to Costco with him. Someone's getting saved. <laughs> he may not do it from up here, but I guarantee you when he talks to someone, if you send him over to do a handyman job, that house is getting saved. Because he's heeding that call. Some of you, God has given gifts, and you don't even know what they are. Because you don't even want to know. Oh, what if he sends me to the Sudan? He won't, unless he puts that desire. See, he gives you the will and the to-do. So he not only puts the desire in your heart to do it, he empowers you. He gives you the power. He pours out His Spirit upon you. He says, you are anointed. Whoosh! Go do it. <laughs> and it's like an out-of-body experience. You're going, what am I doing here? What happened? And you see God move in a dramatic and mighty way. <coughs> well, well, that's easy for you, Mr. Pastor. You, you don't know how many times I've blown it. You don't know the magnitude of my failure. You don't think I've blown it? You don't think I failed? Maybe not as bad as you, but. <laughs> I've blown it a lot of times, probably worse than you. You don't feel good enough? Oh, I'm not, I mean, who am I? I'm a sinner. I'm not good enough to do that. Really? Really? It's our fourth word. Look at Romans 8, verse 30. Moreover, whom he predestined, 
These he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. Justified. God justified you after God called you to his team. And the word justified, remember what it means? Just as if you've never sinned. Now, does that mean here you're not going to sin? No, I guarantee you each and every one of you are going to sin today. In fact, some of you are sitting right now thinking, is he ever going to shut up? <laughs> you will sin. You are flesh. Jesus himself said, no, yeah, you're going to sin. But it's what do you do with that when you do it? See, do you understand? God says you're justified. He sees you just as if you've never sinned. So you make a mistake. So you blow it. What do you do with it? Do you shrink back? Are you like a turtle? I need to protect myself. Or, or do you step out, dust off your knees, say, I blew it. Forgive me, God. I'm sorry. Teach me from this lesson and press forward. Amen. When Paul says he's pressed forwarding for the high calling, in Christ Jesus, do you think he's going, perfect? <laughs> no. He blew it too. He made mistakes. And he suffered. And see us, we make mistakes. I quit. We suffer. I quit. Paul says, I press forward for the prize, the, call, the high calling in Christ Jesus. There's a great prize. He's pressing forward. God justified you, just as if you've never sinned, which means God declares you right and has robed you in His righteousness, justifying you, but every now and then, you feel like you're in a seasonal slump, don't you? You don't feel like that. I'm in a, I'm in a slump, and you don't feel justified. You don't feel good enough. But listen, that is not from God. That is from the pit. That's from the pit. The question is, if you sin, what are you going to do? Far too many Christians are impotent because all they do is see their sin. They're impotent. And, and, and they don't see themselves as God sees them. They don't see what God sees. They don't allow them. And so they, because they don't see what God sees, they allow themselves to drift away, to drift spiraling down. We can see this very clearly in Zechariah. I'm going to show you the first verse in the New King James, but then I want you to listen to a newer translation which explains it. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at, right, at his right hand opposing him. Do you realize that the devil is opposing every believer? He's in opposition to you? But listen to a newer translation. Listen to this, please. Just listen. Then he showed me Joshua, the chief priest, standing in front of the messenger of the Lord. Satan the accuser was standing at Joshua's right side to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, I, the Lord, silence you, Satan. I, the Lord, who has chosen Jerusalem, silence you. Isn't this man like a burning log snatched from the fire? Joshua was wearing filthy clothes. He's wearing filthy clothes. And I was standing in front of the messenger. And the messenger said to those who were standing in front of him, Remove Joshua's filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, See, I have taken your, taken your sin away from you, and I will dress you in fine clothing. So I said, Put a clean turban on his head. And they put a clean turban on his head, and they dressed him while the messenger of the Lord was standing there. And the messenger of the Lord advised Joshua, this is what the Lord, the, the Lord of the army says. If you live according to my ways, conform. If you conform according to my ways and follow my requirements, you will govern my temple and watch over my courtyards. Then I will give you free access to walk among those standing here. What was that? We see Joshua's destiny. His calling, His sanctification. We see His justification. But you still feel like you're in filthy rags. You walked in here going, I'm in filthy rags. Uh, I don't belong. No, you do belong. God has taken your filthy rags. He has clothed you in His righteousness as white as snow. He sees your sins no more. Hallelujah. You are right in God's sight. Okay? 
He's made you good enough, even if you don't feel good enough. He took away your filthy rags. He clothed you in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That is your position. And listen, in Christ, by the blood of the Lamb, you are the righteousness of God. If you don't believe me, argue with God about it. That's what His Word says. Do you blow it? Yes, you do. But what do you do with it? And just take this a step further. Just take a step further. Step into the call. What is God saying to you? Step into it. Try it. See what happens. Before it's too late. Before it's too late. See, one day your phone's going to stop ringing. You know, we love these new phones because it tells us who's calling. You don't, it's like when it says blocked, I never answer it. I don't know you. Yeah. Do, 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 do. Oh, it's God. Uh, I'm a little busy right now, God. Nah. Eh. Oh, sorry, God. Eh. No, no, not, not right now, God. I'm busy. I'm doing my thing. Uh, pretty soon, God's going to stop calling. He's going to stop calling. The word glorified in the Greek is doxin, not as in the dog. <laughs> and what it literally means, and I love this, clothed in splendor. See, this speaks of our new body. God is going to clothe you in splendor. It's it's the glory that comes in eternity. But the idea is is that there is a value and an abiding relationship with God. And this word is in the past present tense. It's It's not a future thing. He says you are glorified. He's already done it and he's doing it right now. It's a past present thing. All of these things are like, he has done this. It's done deal. It's a done deal. You don't see it because you don't want to. But it's a done deal. And someday, someday you're going to go, wow, he was right. It's a done deal. See, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, we read, But we all... With unveiled face, behold, in a, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image of the same image from glory to glory, just as the Spirit, just uh, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. We're being transformed from glory to glory. Now, if this was a Pentecostal church, you guys would all be jumping in the aisles, going Hallelujah, Hallelujah, <laughs> praise the Lord, and I'd be going, I testify from glory to glory, Hallelujah. But here we go. Oh, that's nice. Very well said, Pastor. <laughs> but you know what, church? You've got to start getting excited about what God's going to do. Amen. You need to start getting excited about what God wants to do. I mean, that doesn't mean we you know, break out the tambourines and trumpets and all that, but you need to be excited about what God wants to do. God wants to do glorious and wonderful things in your life. And God right now is saying, listen, the decisions you make for me today... And then for tomorrow, and then the next day, as the world looks on, they're going to notice, they're going to say, wasn't that that loser? How did he get that promotion? Why is God blessing him? Why is God doing this? Why is God doing that? Why? Because God's hand is on you. And because God knows you, and you're letting God conform you. Remember conforming? He's conforming you. He's guiding you. He's leading you. And and, and you've stopped resisting. And if that's not you, it's because you are resisting. You're resisting God. You're doing your own thing. You know better than God. And there's a golden opportunity right now to give up your will and to give into God's plan for your life, to draw closer to God so you won't ever miss out on one single thing that God has for you. And there's a reason you don't want to miss out on anything that God has for you. Look at verse 31. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Well, that's a good reason to have a good relationship. He's for you and He gives you all things in His will. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Is it God who justifies? 
Who is he who condemns? Is it Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us? Do you realize everything that God has done for us in Christ Jesus? And once you realize this, it should leave you speechless or jumping for joy. Both are acceptable. But did you see the position that Jesus is at right now? Did you see that? Look at the end of verse 34. Who also makes intercession for us. Well, who is he who condemns? The same person who brings a charge against God's elect. Who is that? It's the devil. The devil. He's bringing charges against you. He's bringing accusations against you. But some of you have gotten pretty good at it too. Some of you are pretty good at it now too. Who else? Does it matter? It is Christ who died. And furthermore, who is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. This word intercession is a very important word. You know what it means? To appeal. To appeal. Jesus Christ is at the right hand of God the Father to appeal or plead our case for us. The idea is we've got a great defense attorney. At, right now in heaven, there's a great defense attorney who's never lost a case. Amen. And if he's your attorney, you're not going to lose. You are going to win. He's pleading your case. The devil is accusing you. He's bringing all these accusations, all these things against you. The devil's out there. Hey, David did this. David did that. And Jesus goes, he's mine, Dad. He's mine. He's pleading my case. Why? Because if God is for you, which literally means God is on your side. If God is on your side, or if you're on God's team, who can be against you? Who can be against you and succeed? No one. No one. You plus God is a majority. Do you understand that? You hold the majority. If you plus God, you're the majority. Listen, God knows you. He's got your number. Oh boy, does he have some of your guys' numbers. He knows the number of hairs on your head as well as those that you're missing. Some of you are missing quite a few. And he's for you. And this is a great thing. Why? Look at verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death or life or angels nor principalities or powers nor things present nor things to come. Now did you notice there's nothing about your past? Did you see anything about your past? Then you stop bringing up your past. Get over it. He has. Neither things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Now think about this list. What if these things happened to you? What would you think? What's the first thing that would cross your mind if all this stuff happened to you? Because it happened to Paul. What's the first thing? God doesn't love me. God hates me. All these things are happening. What's the second thing you're going to think? I'm out of here. I'm hitting the road. I'm sick of, uh-uh. The Christianity isn't for me. But Paul here, who is well acquainted with all of this stuff, wants to stress that even in the worst of circumstances, nothing can, nothing will separate us from God's love and God's plenity for eternity for those who believe. See, you can't be separated from God's love or God's plan for eternity. But right now, there's in the middle. It's called your life. And you can either walk with Him or against Him. Paul is literally searching the universe, literally searching the universe to find anything. I mean, he's ransacking, he's beating the bushes, he's looking for anything that can separate you from God's love as he talks about both sin and the demonic realm. And he says, I am persuaded that neither death, and when he says death, he's talking about sin, because 
Sin brought death. Amen. But Jesus conquered sin and death. Hallelujah. Nor life, nor angels. This is where he's talking about the demonic realm. Or principalities, nor powers. Nothing present, nothing to come. Nothing that's in the air, nothing that's below, no other created thing. He says, nothing, any other created thing shall be able to separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Yeah. Death can't do it. Sin can't do it because Jesus conquered it all. Amen. He conquered it all. Paul says that we are more than conquerors. He didn't say we will be more than conquerors. He says you are more than conquerors. And this is important. Do you understand to be more than a conqueror is different than just being a conqueror? See, a conqueror enjoys victory after the battle. To be more than a conqueror means you enjoy victory before the battle. Before the battle. What that means is you're not fighting to get victory. You're fighting from the position of the victorious. You're victorious in Christ Jesus. God loves you. God has a plan. God is stretching forth His hand. And He's saying, Are you ready? Do you hear me now? Are you ready? Father, we thank You for Your love and Your grace. We thank you for speaking to your church. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the promises that we have in Jesus Christ. We thank you that not only are we more than conquerors, that we have the realization that nothing will separate us from your love. So Father, right now we come to you, hearts open. Speak to us. Before I say amen, there's only one thing that keeps you holding back from enjoying the love of God, that separates you from the love of God. If you've never asked Jesus into your life as your Savior, then you do not know the love of God. That is separating you from Him today. But you can bridge that gap because Jesus has built the road if you've never asked Jesus to be your Savior, you don't know the love of God. You need to know the love of God. And, and right now, you need to stand up or raise your hand and say, I want to know the love of God. I want to know the peace that passes understanding. And if you feel that you're not walking in God's plan for your life, if you've been opposing God, if you've been resisting God, you also need to stand up or raise your hand right now and say, I I'm tired of doing this on my own. God bless you, the Lord sees you. God bless you, ma'am, the Lord sees you. Anyone else been fighting God? You're ready to right now? The Lord sees you. God bless you. The Lord sees you. God bless you. You know, if your hand is up, you reach forth, you say, God, I'm ready to take your hand. Just, just, just tell him in your heart, I'm, I, want, I want to take your hand. I'm ready. I don't want to do this on my own anymore. I need you. I, I want to know your love. I want to walk with you. I want, I want to walk in your plan for my life. Does anybody else want to walk in God's plan for your life? Let him know that you're tired and you just want to give up. Father, you see each and every hand that's up right now. Stretch forth, hearts crying out to you. I ask right now that you would just pour out your spirit upon them. That you would, oh so gently and lovingly, take their hand and begin to lead and guide them. Lord, help them make every decision they make for your glory and for your sake. Lord Jesus, we love you and we thank you for all you do. We give you all the glory and honor that's due your name. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Prayer